say, I've never seen this many people in this restaurant at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's kind of throwing me a little bit. Um, well, Bob was saying, uh, next door at these apartments, um, we're 20 years old here. Uh, Rochester, we opened up in uh, 1998. And what I, what I was just talking about, Bob, is when we came here, people were threatening to put apartments up there in 1998. Also, underground on the viaduct. So it's, I, I see it as a kind of, uh, you know, um, from Syracuse to Rochester, kind of a rebirth of downtowns. Because uh, I, th I think we've all seen um, in, in 20 years what's happened uh, to the upstate economy and what's coming back right now. So it's kind of exciting to see that it's happening in Syracuse, it's happening here, to just see these apartments downtown. It's kind of blowing my mind right now. So, I've been, you know, I've been around long enough, I guess. So, I, the name of this is success is not always a straight line. And I've always had this thing is the road to success is always under construction. And I mean that sincerely. Um, uh, Syracuse is 30 years right now, but I've been in this business about 35. I started in uh, 1983 as a mobile concession. We used to call ourselves dinosaur concessions. And we started this with a 55-gallon drum that we cut in half. And, uh, well, it really started with a motorcycle because I, I started riding a bike in 1981 and started going to different biker events in 1982, 83. And the genesis of Dinosaur Barbecue started at these bike events where we could not get a decent plate of food. Yeah. So me and my partners at this point were like, damn, because we were, you know, I, I was working construction, I was doing a lot of odd jobs. I was like, we should get in the business of feeding bikers. Like, what, does, what does that even mean? We had like ten dollars between us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's, I mean, we were as broke as uh, three people could be. But we decided we were going to get in the business of feeding bikers. But, so a buddy of ours was a welder. He weld, took a 55 gallon drum, cut it in half, and that's how Dinosaur Barbecue started. We've seen that at these biker events, there was always volunteers cooking food. So I went to the promoters of these events and said, hey, I'll kick you back 10%, let us do the food. And at that point, that was a great idea because these guys did not want to do the food. They weren't good at it. So we started that entire business and started going up and down the East Coast doing bike events, fairs, festivals. So it was kind of a nomadic lifestyle for about five years. So after around 1987, we decided to get off the road because uh, if anyone's ever followed carnivals or lived a carny lifestyle, it's not a very healthy existence. <laughs> so after five years, I, I really wanted to settle down. So we ended up um, selling into Syracuse and opened up the first dinosaur in 1980. Wow, it's amazing. That's 30 years. And I can remember certain things like it was yesterday and then other things I can't remember two weeks ago. So <laughs> it's, it, it, it's unbelievable what's been going on this long. But, you know, going back to um, uh, uh, the road to success, always on construction, I always look at it as there, there's, there's the road, there's due north. This is the way we're looking to achieve anything. But along that way, there's obstacles. You have to go around them, you go under them, you go over them, or you, you take a sledgehammer and go right through them. Because it's not easy. Nothing is ever easy in this world, especially business. And, you know, if you look back then, starting a business with absolutely no money presents a lot of challenges. So there's challenges in everything. But, you know, you go back to the road, we would make a little bit of money, put it back into the business, make it, you know, lose lose that on the next gig, the next gig after that, make money. So the first dinosaur was built by concession money. We never took out any loans. Actually, nobody would give us any money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not like that. That's the one thing when you do, actually, uh, it's kind of the paradox. When you need money, nobody wants to give it to you. When you don't need money, everyone wants to give it to you. So, so um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's that. So we, we know what we know what it's like to bootstrap this business, and um, so from that point we ended up opening Dinosaur from gig to gig. So now I'm thinking, you know, we're on the road. You know, like if you're at a fair, the fair opens and thousands of people 
you know, flood through the gates and, and you're busy if it's a good event. We thought it was going to be the same thing the second we opened up our doors. This is 1988. We got motorcycles in front. And back then, the biker community was a little different. Um, now your doctor and your lawyer ride Harleys. Back then, it wasn't so. It was a big dividing line between who rode motorcycles and who didn't at that time. So people were a little, didn't know what to make of us. So we opened up those doors and we did breakfast at that time. And I had eggs ready to go. I had, I, you know, piles of home fries and not one person walked through that door. <laughs> so here we are, I'm just sitting there watching my eggs turn green. I was thinking, I, I literally thought people were going to be lining up for this food. So for the first two years, uh, thank God we were in the restaurant business because we would have starved. And, that, and, and I mean that sincerely, my, my dishwashers, dishwashers, my dishwasher, <laughs> which it was also myself, it was myself, my partner, and we was called Roustabout. We, we all did everything. But everyone else made more, that guy made more money than we did at that time. So with starting your own business, there's a ton of sacrifice that you're going to make if you actually believe what you're doing is worth it. So that, that, that's one of those road to success. And if you don't have any money, the things that go wrong are really hard to fix. And you've got to get very creative when you, when you do that. Now we can actually say, geez, let's fix those or that's broke, let's fix it. And it gets a lot easier. So after about two years, I could close those doors 20 different times. And I thought about it. So I was, a, I was dating a girl in Miami, and her father um, owned a construction company. He's like, you know, never mind this restaurant. Just come, come down here and work for me. I said, Miami. Wow, that, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> but I always seemed like I knew we could do this. So um, I'm really glad I didn't. So now after about two years, it started catching on a little bit. Because barbecue in the Northeast, there was none. So we, matter of fact, my barbecue, you talk about evolution. We called ourselves dinosaur barbecue. That was really, it was sausage, peppers, and onions. And uh, my partner did um, uh, grilled steak sandwiches. It was no, we, we didn't know what barbecue was. I grew up in New York. That, that's putting a hamburger on a grill. As soon as we started going, down the Mason Dixon, across the Mason Dixon line, we were told in no uncertain terms, this was not barbecue. I don't know what you're calling it. We don't know what this Italian sausage is. But it certainly isn't barbecue. I said, what are these people talking about? What is this barbecue? So I became kind of obsessed with it at this point. So I got on my motorcycle and I rode to Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee, to me, which was the Shangri-La barbecue. And then I got my first taste of what smoked meat was. I was like, damn, okay, I think I, I, think I see it. I think I see the future here. <laughs> We're going to bring barbecue to, to New York. So I look at my barbecue game and how that's evolved over the years. And my barbecue in 1988, I probably would not recognize it at this point. But it was, and remember, back at that time, there was no cookbooks on barbecue. There was no internet. There was no, um, no food network. Nobody was talking about barbecue. So we, that's, that's, that's how we made our bones back then. So 1988 to 1991 was some very lean years. So we kept having to go back on the road to keep the business um, afloat. Then around 1991, the secret ingredient that was missing was, was a bar. Because people were just viewing us as a place to, you know, just get a quick plate of food and get out of there. So we finally got a liquor license in 1991, and that was the key to unlocking our potential. Because people looked at us totally differently now. They, they wanted that long neck of beer with that barbecue. Now we were open up late. So we did away with breakfast, which I hated doing. I mean, I despise breakfast. I was a, um, no breakfast cook should be angry anymore. <laughs> and that was me at 6 o'clock in the morning. So we did away with breakfast, and now we became late night. And we always, always listened to the type of music. It was blues, and at that point, soul rock. And, and we had this little cassette player, and that was the music in that little front room of uh, Dinosaur in Syracuse. Then we opened up the other side, and this guy came to me and said, Hey man, 
how about if I play some music? Um, and it was just it was a guy named Dr. Blue. And Dr. Blue started on Thursday nights live music and service, just him. And from that point, everything started clicking. So now motorcycles became, you know, get more into the mainstream. Blues music hit a up, upward bend. So we're kind of lucky in, in respect that we hit the things that we were doing started becoming, started trending in the in the 90s. Motorcycles. People weren't afraid now to go to a place with motorcycles in front of them. Blues music and barbecue, they all started getting attention into the 90s. So we just rode that wave. So we were lucky or we were prepared. And I believe uh, success is when uh, or, or luck is when uh, preparation meets opportunity. And we were ready at that point. Uh, ready, and I, I, I'm going to back up with that. We really weren't ready for it. <laughs> because all of a sudden the shit hit the fan, and, and man, we just played catch up for about five years. And in that catch up, we started, um, this, this is how I came to Rochester. We started brewing, or um, uh, I started part, uh, selling my barbecue sauce in the restaurant. Put it in, you ought to put this in a bottle. So I ended up in Rochester. Actually, before Rochester, I ended up in this little hillbilly plan on the Missouri Arkansas border where I would fly into Memphis, rent a car, and then go up to Arkansas and brew my sauce. They used to charge me six bucks an hour to brew my own barbecue sauce. It was awesome. <laughs> but unfortunately, you had to ship it up here. So that, that negated, and, and plus plane fare. And, but I like going to Memphis, so it wasn't a was a big thing for me. I ended up in Rochester brewing my barbecue sauce. And it was over on Lyle Avenue, and I come right by this location. And I was fascinated by this building. I said, what are they doing with this? Because if you guys, well, I knew it's been around a long time. This was, um, what was the name of this club here? Uh, a Carpe Diem. And then Carpe Diem closed that. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Somebody's been to Carpe Diem. <laughs> <laughs> but it was this old train station, and I was fascinated by the, architect, uh, the architecture of this building. So uh, the Farish, this is uh, Max Farish at the time, and we negotiated this lease uh, with, with Mr. Farish, who was an extremely tough negotiator. Anyone uh, knew this gentleman back in the day, he, he was hardcore. And we ended up opening this, and the money we sunk into this was, it was, you should have seen this place back then. It was, um, not, not, uh, that was a platform for the train station. And there was really no upkeep over 90 years on it. So that, just a lot of work had to be done in this building. But I was not ready for a second location. I didn't build any infrastructure. I didn't take into consideration um, all the work that needs to be done for to grow. So I put nothing in place to grow. We were fortunate enough, when we opened this restaurant, we got overwhelmed right from the start because a lot of people would go from Rochester to, to business in Syracuse here. So it became my career of um, fire, then aim. <laughs> Which I look back on it. Man, if I, if I had to do these things over again, I would have put a lot more forethought into how to build an infrastructure before I make a move. So now I spent my life just back and forth, racing up and down the throughway, coming here, going back to Syracuse, because I was basically the manager of both places, owning and managing both places. And it became a lot. And, and, and that, that's, when people ask me what I've learned and what I would do differently, it would be to invest in the people beforehand. So we became, again, another five years of catching. Luckily, we pulled it off. Um, but then I get the next bright idea, because I'm from New York originally, to open up a restaurant in New York City. Now, if I had any, any brains, business sense, I would have went to Albany first, or Buffalo. But I decided to go to New York. And it was more emotional reasons. Um, I, I got a lot of family down there, and I always wanted to be back in New York City. But I made the same mistake again. I did not set up the proper infrastructure. And now, and, and you talk about obstacles. 
said that the road to success being always under construction. If anyone's ever tried to build in New York City, <coughs> excuse me, I mean, talk about a learning experience. But we pulled it off, and we're going on 15 years in the Manhattan location. But once again, now I finally get a little smart. I'm like, all right, I got to change everything. So now we put the right people in place. Uh, uh, we got the right. I, I started investing in infrastructure. So now we got. So here we are today. We got Syracuse 30, Rochester 20, Harlem 15, and um, my God, the, the, the lessons and the mistakes. Uh, I could go on and on because. One thing I do, though, I, I make a mistake, I try not to make that mistake again. And I probably have made every mistake in the book, in the restaurant business. Um, yeah, and, uh, but I'm a fast learner, which is, which is the good news. So next, where do we go from here? Oh my god, let's see. So now we got Harlem. Now we open up um, it's another five years. And we open up Troy. Then we open up... Um, now we have another big uh, uh, Let's go into 2008. My original partners wanted to get out. So now I brought in private equity for the first time. Um, we bought my partners out and we redid the company. So now we decide to start growing. And now uh, for the first time, we're capitalized. And um, now we, now that's how we get into Troy and Newark, all these other places. So let's just fast forward. And this is really like, great news is after 10 years of private equity, I just bought back Dinosaur Barbecue. So um, I was a minority owner, or not the majority owner, uh, got for the last six, seven years. Now I'm back full time, back into Dinosaur, which is absolutely thrilling. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, so here I am, uh, I'm 58 years old. I've been in this business now 35 years. Um, and I feel like we're a startup all over again. So I'm not approaching this as dinosaur as um, I'm taking back a 30-year-old company. No, I'm, I'm a startup again. So I'm back to the hunger that I had when I started this business. Because I'm looking at things totally different. And everything changes in the world. So forget dinosaur uh, as it is. Think about what's happened in the restaurant business in the last 30 years. So, my job now is, what, what does the next 10 look like? What does the next 20 look like? Because at 58, I'm completely rejuvenated again. And you know, I, I, I contemplated a couple times over the last few years, like, geez, what, what would the world look like if I just, could I retire? Could I, could I just back off a little bit? And I did that for probably about a year, but I opened up a pizza place. It, um, in, in Syracuse called Pizza Region now, it's right across the street from the original dino. So I dabbled in that, and, and that, that's an awesome place. But what that restaurant did for me, because it was a startup, and we started it fresh, it, it, it renewed why I love this business. And it isn't to me about growing it. Like we've got eight locations. I don't care right now about adding another location. All I care about is the eight restaurants. And the charge now is like, how do I make this greater? How, can, how do I make this better? So I'm looking at this like a guy who just bought into a business that, that's coming from the outside. So I'm, I'm looking at this with totally fresh eyes. And, and that's what is exciting again. So I didn't know I could get this excited over Dinosaur after 30 years, but I'm really like kind of, kind of pumped up over this. So. Um, yeah, here we are. It's all new again. So, <laughs> as you can see, we got a brand new bar back here. So it's all about tweaking and, 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 and just, I'm going to grow this company from the inside out. It's not all about opening up. And, and we did. We went on a, a, a growth spurt that I just, I just don't care anymore, to be honest with you. I don't care about opening up new restaurants unless it was something like in a, a pizza or something that's a fresh concept. I want to grow dinosaur internally. And uh, that, that's, that's my charge right now. So there's, there's 35 years in, in about 20 minutes. Um, because this is such a, a, a smaller group, 
Does anybody have any questions? I'd love to. It, 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 yes, sir. What do you do as your uh, growth opportunities now that you've taken back to the like, like, what do you mean by growing it from the inside out? Well, it's, it's looking at every restaurant and looking at the opportunities inside the restaurants. One of the, 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 one of the biggest challenges right now, and this is, a, a, again, because unemployment is so great, is growing your teams. So I'm looking at the teams, number one, is growing, growing the people inside the restaurant. Because we can't do anything if we don't have great people. And, I, and this isn't just a restaurant business. I mean, my God, every, every business owner I talk to is having the same issues of getting great, getting and keeping great people. So that's the number one challenge of this business. Um, so it starts with that, and then it's looking at, you know, like remodeling this bar. It hasn't been, hadn't been touched for 20-something years. And we had holes in the floor. Things were just falling apart. And it's going back and what do the restaurants need to be successful? So it's positioning ourselves for the next 10 years. And it's, it's going back to every restaurant, because there's eight of them. We've got over eight, my God, we've got about 900 employees, uh, nine restaurants with uh, pizza. And then there's enough to keep us busy right here, right now. Um, yeah. yes. yes. So I've worked in the restaurant business a bit growing up and mm -hmm. seen a lot of really good management and employees leave, mm -hmm. overworked, underpaid, everybody's seen it. What are some of your ideas to try to keep keep those valuable employees? Like you said, originally you wish you would have started with the right people and then grown. Mm -hmm. What are you What are you going to do to keep keep the right employees? Well, it, it, it starts with culture, uh, and I think when we grew a little too fast, we lost a little bit of our culture. Because I'm the founder, owner, I stepped aside for about three years, four years, and um, it's getting the culture back. We're com we, we, we pay very well, we're, we're more than competitive, but money's not everything. There's got to be a culture that people want to be a part of. And to me, that is what I want to bring into Dinosaur again, is that great culture. And, 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 and build that team and, and, and create an atmosphere that people want to be into. Because money's money. You can jump around you know, for better salaries, but if someone actually enjoys what they do, where they, where they work. That, to me, that's step one. Yeah. Yes? Was private equity strategy different than your strategy in your Very much so. Very much so. So private equity, um, I always look at it as, for the first five years, they left me alone. And I, I can grow really well at about one a year. That's about my bad point. That's what I, I liked to do. And I was, I was good at that. Then after a while, private equity wants a return on their investment. That's their business. That's what they want. They, so after about five years, there became pressure to grow. Uh, but the growth was something that I wasn't good at. And I recognize that. I am not going to open up four, three dinosaurs a year, four a year, and be good at that. So I went to my partners at that point. I said, you guys are hell-bent on this. You've got to get somebody that's done this before, because A, I don't like it. B, I'm not good at it, because I don't like it. And, <laughs> and C, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I don't like it. So that's where, <coughs> excuse me, that's where we hired a CEO from the outside. And it, it just, it, it wasn't right for our culture. And then, you know, you look back, again, these are, um, these are things you learn from. Like every, anything that happens in life, you don't learn from that. You know, you're, you're just doomed and repeat it. So, my growth is we'll do it when we feel like it. <laughs> that's how I grow, and that's what I'm good at. But I, I'm, I'm not good at like, all right, let's put this growth machine into overdrive. I hate it, to be honest with you. That's right. How do you describe your culture? Uh, describe your culture. That's a, that's a good question. Um, well, um, um, it, it, it started. Anyone ever read this book, The Founder's Mentality? If you haven't, if you're an entrepreneur, you should read this book. And it, it was a, this book helped me get back to the place I'm in right now. So when you start a business, it's scrappy. It's, 
hands-on. It's you know on the fly, and it's very exciting to be a, to the people around it to be part of something new. As you get bigger, you you can you can fall into this trap of becoming too bureaucratic. Too decisions don't get made as quick. Um, things aren't as exciting. Layers get put onto it. So my job right now is getting rid of all the bureaucracy that happens when you have 900 people. And it's getting entrepreneurial again and getting back to the basics of this business and having the founder be a part of this again. When the founder of any business, if he does a good job, and I don't think I did a good job on the handoff, because I'm more of a hands-on guy. I really like the core of what the restaurant business is. So it's getting back into it and, and celebrating the people that are working. It, also, it all goes back to the people. And then it gets back into the relentless tinkering of making things better instead of having status quo. So, and that creates the energy and I think that creates the culture. But it's really the person at the top and all the people that are with them who deeply give a shit. And that is what this culture is in the, re is in the rebuilding of. So it's hard to define exactly what it is. Yes? Um, so I'm sort of in the first five years of my own business. Mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you deal with the setbacks? I mean, you talked about not knowing, mm -hmm. you know, where you were going to eat because it's a good thing you were in the restaurant business. I, I worked a second shop for a very long time and I now kind of feel like I'm almost on the cusp of really feeling secure, but it's it's hard to kind of keep going sometimes when we said that. So how do you, how do, you deal with those, those challenges? That, 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 well, a really good sense of perseverance because you, you know, all right, so I, without knowing what your problems are, because there's, there's many the biggest problem is running out of cash. That is probably in any business. Is, you may love what you do, and, uh, but boy, when you start running out of cash, that's, that's a different problem. But if you can see that light at the end of the tunnel, you, you've got to strategize on what those problems are, how to get over, around it, under it. But that light at the end of the tunnel has got to be for real. And um, yeah, when if, it, if it's not a cash flow problem, I'm not going to say anything's easy. It's just it's, it's pure perseverance and take your lumps and learn from them and move on. Without knowing your set of problems, it'd be really hard to give you really to give good advice. I just I just knew that. Um, holy shit! I, I I I still believe in this. That's why I just bought back into this because I. You know, there's tons of problems in the restaurant. Like, the restaurant business is almost insane to get into now. I think I was lucky to get in back when I got in. Now there's, so, I question my own sanity sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I got back, back into this, but, uh, uh, I, it's hard to answer that. Yeah. But it's, if you still believe in it, you'll figure out a way. And if you got the cash flow to navigate. You talked about the trends in the 90 and you were fortunate enough to mm -hmm. ride that. What do you see as the trends moving forward? Obviously, uh, you know, craft beer, I would assume, is a big part of what you're trying to capitalize on. But is there anything well, else that you see in terms of trends in the restaurant business moving forward? Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, there's probably, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you like a big hurdle that's coming up and, and how I would model my business differently if I was getting into this now. So if, there's a thing called the tip credit, you probably know that, but in New York City, the minimum wage is $15 an hour. So, if you if you live in New York City, you're seeing all these fast, casual rest of the, they're everywhere now, they didn't used to be. If this goes through, we're going to be paying service $15 an hour, which totally shatters the um, um, business models, and there's no there's not a server that works for dinosaur that makes under a minimum wage. So I would I would do this concept as a fast casual going forward, so I wouldn't need all the all, all the amount of people that you need 
if you want a full service restaurant. So that labor is over here. That's that's the biggest challenge. You talk about craft beer. When we first opened, we 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 did a thing called uh, uh, oh my god we, we did all we profiled regional beers and then the craft beer movement started. Pete's Wicked Ale, Sam's Adams, Sam Adams, Anchor Steam, and we were in the forefront of that at that time. But now there's so much great beer. Having craft beer, you're not special anymore. It's just the way it is. Everybody's got great beer right now. So you, barbecue, um, there's more barbecue now than there's ever been. So the, the competition is so much greater. So you have to examine every aspect of this business. And I look at lunch is what's changed dramatically. People used to go out for lunch, spend an hour, go back. Now you've got to be fast. You've got to turn these over. People don't have the time. People are eating at their desks now more, more than ever. So it's changing the business a little bit to reflect the consumer's needs. And then the consumer's needs are so different than they were with the internet, with Yelp, with online reservations. Um, Social media, my God, there's, there's our social media guy. I never had to employ a social media person before. <laughs> no, seriously, that's, you, you change with the world. And um, if you don't, you get left behind. So part of uh, Dino Point 2 is also looking at, you know, what can we do? Like right now for me, it's make lunch faster for people. Get people, you know, attack lunch more. People have such a limited time. So there's so many opportunities, but you always got to be peeking around corners of what's next. And um, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if I answered that question, but man, oh man, there's some challenges out there, no doubt. Uh, anybody else? Yes. So have you noticed uh, since you founded Dino, um, it getting tougher for smaller chains to compete with the larger chains? A little bit what you were talking about uh, with them being able to leverage investments in technology. Um, smaller chains versus bigger. You know, I don't even look at it from the chain perspective. I just look at it from the sheer amount of restaurants that are now. I'll use Harlem as a perfect example. When we opened up Harlem in 2004, we opened up on the far west side in an area that was, it was a pretty dangerous at that point. But, and Harlem, it had restaurants, but they were. Uh, a lot of old school soul food joints. And there wasn't, like, below 125th, between 125th and 10th Avenue, there wasn't a lot of restaurants before you get to Lenox Avenue. There is now over 100 restaurants between where we are and where, uh, we'll, we'll just say Lenox Avenue, uh, Malcolm X, the dividing line of Park, Fifth Avenue, over that way. There's over 100 different restaurants that are. So the people that would travel from Central Harlem to get to this side have a hundred, they have to go buy a hundred different storefronts by the time they get to us. And you could say that in Rochester, um, uh, not, and New York is like hyper everything. But there's so many, so it's, I just don't look at it as a chain, and, and really I don't even know if that's our competition. It's, it's the sheer volume of restaurants. Is is what the uh, competition is. Yeah. yeah. Is? Yes, sir. I'm a marketing guy, so mm -hmm. an interesting question of how did, was there anything you needed to do, or did you kind of leverage the Harleys in front of every location? You know, I mean, I, yeah. I would tell you that uh, I'm not a biker, mm -hmm. but uh, appreciate them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would tell you, my wife, what traveling one night. The station, like, I want to buy this car. Like, All these bikers, we're not mm -hmm. going there. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that? <laughs> it was early. Yeah, there it was you. early. But I mean, I can remember that discussion, yeah. you know? And I'm just curious how you, was there anything you did, or did you even leverage that? Because there's a there's a, there's a a different opportunity to say, hey, I can, this is a cool place to be, too, right? Yeah. Um, I can also say, we, and Jason did a test of this. Uh, uh, before Jason, our, our, our marketing guys, so, social media and, and online, we were 
our marketing was terrible. There was no marketing. We didn't really put, I mean, our marketing, I looked at it as community involvement. Somebody needs something. Somebody needs food, this event, this event. That's how I looked at marketing. But I never looked at, no, nah, what are we going to do with all these bikes? How are we going to market leverage this? It just kind of like happened. And that is kind of the story, guys. So far, this shit just happened. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say I had a clever marketing uh, campaign or scheme, but, but about a year ago, you know, we brought Jason. I'm like, dude, our, our online presence is awful. We don't do anything. How do we? Yeah, because you know, talk about getting with the times. Instagram. I don't know. And really, I'm. Of course, I have a smartphone, and uh, but I'm not. It's not my forte, it's not what I'm great at. So we needed to get up our game. So there's our real first marketing. It's been recently, over the last year, two years, maybe. <coughs> but other than that, it's been nothing. <laughs> How'd you come up with the name Dinosaur? What? What's that? The name Dinosaur, I was just curious. And didn't raise my hand. Oh, okay. Uh, well, <laughs> well, we're talking about marketing, marketing, so I thought I'd ask about the. So, all right, hey, uh, this is a good story, and again, it has nothing to do with anything clever. <laughs> <laughs> my original partner was named Dino. Okay, Dino was, uh, I can still uh, see Dino at a uh, Syracuse Dino as my head of security. But Dino in the day was about 400 pounds, 350 pounds, 400 pounds, and 75% of that was muscle. He was a bad dude. He's bad. Um, he's a, he's a, the guy who got me uh, uh, into Harley's back in way back in the day. And um, you know, it's his name. So we rode old motorcycles. We listened to old blues music. We cooked over open fire. We're like, man, we're like dinosaurs, man. Right? <laughs> And, and Dino Dinosaur, they were like, Dinosaur Barbecue. There it is, there's the name. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with dinosaurs. <laughs> and if you look around the room, man, you don't see a, you don't see any real homage to dinosaurs. <laughs> I don't know, when we first opened, people would say, geez, you gotta put a T Rex burger on or a Brontosaurus ribs. I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> but but here's, a, here's a luck piece. So when we first opened up in 1988, the dinosaur exhibit. Dinosaurs also got popular. <coughs> Excuse me, in the 90s with um, Jurassic, Park. Jurassic Park. So there was a dinosaur exhibit in like 1989, 1990, at the most in Syracuse, and they renamed the street because this was a big deal at the time. Dino Way. So you look at again a little bit of luck in that. We got so much attention. Because we were down to some barbecue, and people thought we named it because of that. <laughs> but we were named it like five years before that, so that was kind of lucky. Yes? Uh, can you talk about the process of expanding your sauce in the retail location? Yeah, yeah, okay, let's see. Um, Alright, so started in um, um, Ray Red Gill in, um, in, uh, in Arkansas, bottled it, sold it in the sauce, in the um, in the restaurants. And then we got the bright idea to go to Wegmans with it. And back in the day, it wasn't hard to get on the shelf. So probably the biggest thing that's changed, and I, and I pity anybody right now that wants to get into that end of the business. It's an awful business. I, it's not my favorite end of the business. You're haggling over nickels and dimes to put these things on the shelf. Um, you have to pay massive slotting fees to get into different supermarkets. And Wegmans was great to us. They put us on the shelf, no slotting. We're talking about the late 90s now. So the, the, that business, I came up with the sauces and all that, the recipes, but I have nothing to do with distribution of it. it it's, it's one of those things I am not good at. So we hire um, uh, brokers and uh, distributors to take care of that. I'll, I'll find out our sauce. Someone will call me and say, hey, I've seen your sauce in Colorado. I was like, they go, how'd you do that? I was like, I don't know. I didn't <laughs> it just ends up out there. So, <clears throat> um, it's a tough business. It's a, it's a nickel and dime business. And it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have a decent business on that, but it's, uh, it, 
uh, I wouldn't want to get into it now. That's that's for damn sure. It's expensive and it's. You know, I, don't, I don't want that. I don't want that. All right. Yes. That's all right. Um, what was it like starting a business with people you were friends with? Because I work with my family, yeah, and that in and of itself is a difficult dynamic. So I can't understand, you know, it's difficult for me to understand how you might deal with some of those challenges with people you're friends with. Well, it makes me fire everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's terrible. It's terrible. I've, you know how many friends I've fired over the years? Yeah. Um, my, my, my friends and partners, I shouldn't say that, because um, I'm friends with, I'm friends with them all still. Like my original partner, we grew up together, but after a while it was just not working out and we came to an agreement, so I'm still friends with him. Matter of fact, I fished him last, uh, he lives in Florida now. My other partners just wanted out of it um, around 19, uh, 2007, so that ended okay. I used to always hire my friends as security, you know, in, uh, back in the day, and that never worked out. So actually, all friends never worked out for me. Um, and not, not in a couple of them were like very mutual. Then I got into business with my son. Um, we opened up uh, a food hall in Brooklyn. And uh, the nice thing about a food hall is there, uh, there was no lease, you could come and go as you please. We came up with uh, uh, this chicken concept. And I love my son to death, but I hate working with him. <laughs> and he hates working with me. So <laughs> I was like, you know, before this relationship deteriorates any further, maybe we should uh, maybe we should get out of this. He's like, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And we uh, we parted ways after. Uh, so it's uh, it's not good. <laughs> um, maybe there's some uh, magic out there that I'm unaware of. And, uh, but it hasn't worked out for me. But the good news is my ex-partners, it was all mutual, and we're still friends to this day, so we ended it the right way. But all the people I've hired, oh my god, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes? Now you talked about uh, back in the day you go, you went down to Memphis and that's where it was, the Shangri-La for you. Did you, do you still today go and kind of uh, do some recon work to see what some of the other trends are? And uh, what do you, where do you like to eat? Oh, man. Uh, as far as barbecue? Anything. Oh, man. Uh, the nice thing of living, uh, so I, I split my time to New York City and, and Syracuse. The nice thing about New York City is there's, I, I probably eat more Asian than I eat anything. Like last night I had Vietnamese, and then before that I had um, uh, Korean. I love Korean food, so I'm on this big Korean kick right now. But if I go to a different city, especially if I'm, I'm in the South, if I'm in Memphis or I'm in Texas or, or anywhere there's good barbecue, I'm going to go eat at that barbecue place just to see what, what's going on. So yes, you have to stay on top of trends, and sometimes you get ins inspired. It doesn't even have to be barbecue. It can be something in a restaurant. I like that. You know, I, matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm doing something from a Mexican place I just went to. We're, we're uh, you know what, I'm not going to get into that because it's going to be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> but I got inspired by something and it gave me an idea. I was like, damn, I, I, I kind of like this. But it had nothing to do with barbecue. It was just something they were doing that. Because a lot of this business is derivative. You know, you, you do, you go into a place. I like the feel of this. What, what are they doing great? And then you modify it to your own. Sometimes you have original ideas, sometimes they're derivatives of other people's ideas. But by eating out as much as I do, and, 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 and living in New York, you have that ability just to walk to all these great restaurants. And then and, and same thing with Rochester Center, because there's so many good places right now. So, I, I can't say there's one food that I it, it probably would be Korean if I had to say anything right now because I'm just I love those bold flavors I I mean they just punch you right in the face and I really do like Korean food so that that would probably be the one that I'm <coughs> excuse me focused on more than anything. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you very much.